The scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village in Samaritan to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now it happened, as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let us first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I pray that you would pour through me this day the words that you would have us hear, that they be your words, not mine, that they be your word, not my opinion, but your word that would meet us at our point of need and equip us to be your people. I pray this. I pray this in confidence, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The essential thing is in, in heaven and earth is a long obedience in the same direction. There, thereby results and has always resulted in a life worth living. This is our mantra for this time in, in Lent. We began this season of Lent recognizing the lengthening of days as an opportunity, an opportunity to soberly reflect on rather than judging our culture, rather than mourning the rancor or standing back and clucking as we look around, we determined to look deeply and honestly at ourselves. At ourselves to discern and acknowledge and to honestly consider whatever might be causing a chasm between us and our families, us and our friends, us and our church, us and our God, and then a determination to amend. Now this hasn't required a somber, lachrymose effort, but a determination to commit to something that we're told always result in a life worth living. So we've taken the phrase of the prominent atheist, Frederick Nietzsche, as a guide. Biblical scholar and theologian Eugene Peterson took the phrase and paired it with psalms of ascent. Songs sung by Jewish pilgrims as they made their way to Jerusalem three times a year. And so we began Lent, determined to stick with it. Pastor Marion Platt spoke of a long obedience in perseverance. Then I returned to the pulpit and spoke of obedience in repentance, changing the direction of our lives. Then we looked at obedience itself, a long compliance to the way of Jesus, and then to worship last week, engaging various biblical texts that illuminated what a life of faithfulness to Jesus would look like. So, once we've surrendered to the love of God, we don't quit. We turn from behaviors and attitudes that have not served us, others, or God well. We determine to do right, 
and we worship. All well and good. That's what we do. But the question is, why? Why would we do all of that? Because our best efforts have gotten where we are. And there is one antidote, and that is Jesus. The Anglican theologian N.T. Wright wrote in simply Jesus. Jesus, the Jesus we might discover if we really looked, is larger, is more disturbing, more urgent than we'd ever imagined. We've successfully managed to hide behind other questions and to avoid the huge, world-shaking challenge of Jesus' central claim and achievement. You see, it is we, the churches, he wrote, who have been the real reductionists. We've reduced the kingdom of God, the realm of God, to private piety. We've reduced the victory of the cross to the comfort of our conscience. We've reduced Easter itself to a happy escapist ending after a sad, dark tale. Now, piety and, and conscience and ultimate happiness are important, but not nearly as important as Jesus. He argues that in many churches over the years, the good news, the good news of the gospel, of Jesus' reality, of Jesus having come to walk with us in our lives, the good news has subtly changed to good advice. So here's how to live, you'll hear in many places. How to pray. Here are techniques for helping you to become a better Christian, a better person, a better husband, or a better wife. And in particular, here's how to make sure you're on the right track for what happens after death. You take this advice and you'll be saved. You won't go to hell, you'll go to heaven. And here's how to do it. It's advice not news. The whole point of advice is to get you to do something in service to a desired result. Now, we all know that there's absolutely nothing wrong with good advice. We can all use it. But it's not the same as news, as witnessing to something that has happened. News is an announcement that something significant has taken place. And part of the problem these days is that, again, we don't recognize what constitutes news as opposed to information, as opposed to misinformation, as opposed to prattling and the chatter of monkeys. So here's the good news that I give you today, that I pray you'll receive in a new way, a fresh way that will pierce your understanding and pierce your heart. Because when we accept the reality of the power of the love of Jesus, our resolute God, nothing is the same. <clears throat> Let's look at our text from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> it testifies to the intentionality of Jesus. It records the sending of the 12 disciples, equipping them, sending them out to do what Jesus has done and shown them. It records several great miracles performed by Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000 and various exorcisms. It details a story of his transfiguration. Luke means to establish on a mountain, to establish Jesus in parity with icons of Israel, with Elijah and Moses. And the voice of God is heard in the clouds saying, this is my son, the chosen, listen to him. And then there's Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. And finally, the final departure from Galilee towards Jerusalem. Let's look at this. Jesus sets his face. He sets his face toward Jerusalem. He goes through Samaria, not around as most others. You know, the people of Samaria and Israel had high contempt for each other. The people of Samaria know who Jesus is. Did you ever think of that? They know who he is. He's the one who does what he does. He's the one who heals and teaches and preaches, but also the one who brings chaos. And they don't want him in their house. 
So word gets back to Jesus, and we can only imagine that, well, he may be annoyed, but he's not surprised, and certainly he's not miffed and upset enough to incinerate the city. That's not the nature of God. So he tells James and John, no, we don't need you to rain down and ask God for fire to destroy them. He rebukes the boys, and he presses on. Why? Because his face is set. And then we have this curious paragraph that establishes the depth of commitment that's called, that's called for to follow Jesus. That, yes, we have to recognize that our home, our habitat, is with God. We need to recognize that, yes, we may mourn our loved ones, but that the purpose of our lives and our living is in our long obedience to Jesus, the way of Jesus, and our long obedience to love as we are loved. And it takes everything. It takes everything we have, everything we will be, and all that we have been. But we persevere. We don't quit. We repent. We lift and we shift to the light of God's love. And we remind each other that this commitment, this obedience, allows us the abundant life that Jesus came to reveal for us, to us. That in this life, in this living the way of Jesus, even the seemingly impossible, the unscalable, the intractable is chipped away. And a fissure, a little crack is revealed to allow the Spirit and God's love to do that which only the Spirit of God can accomplish. And nothing is the same. Jesus enters into our chaos and our fears. Jesus stands with us through all that frightens us. Jesus reminds us that God will not abandon us and brings us to life on the other side of our fears and our distress. Men and women, the antidote to fear, Jesus shows us, isn't power or weapons or revenge or security. No, it's courage. It's compassion. And it's trust in the only thing that does not disappoint. And even when we fail to listen, Jesus is still the antidote showing us an alternative and still forgiving us and loving us and still promising to use us, to use us to care for our neighbor when, when we yield to God's irresistible love. The preacher and the theologian, Will Williman, wrote that no figure in history has received more attention and been less understood than Jesus of Nazareth. And he said much of what's been written recently portrays Jesus as a vaguely kind and a friendly person whose message sometimes pleases but never challenges believers. So people might be even tempted to ask, well, what's all the fuss? What here is worth devoting my life to? Well, very little about that Jesus is worth devoting your life to. Yet, I proclaim to you today another Jesus, the real Jesus, the mysterious preacher from Nazareth who continues to invite us to claim the true meaning of their lives, our lives, by giving our lives away, in the way, in service to God and to others. This Jesus continues to fascinate and to compel us in spite of all the attempts to domesticate his message. In his radical teachings, his loving us to his death, and in his liberating life beyond death, this Jesus teaches and points us to lives worth living through his love. In the name of the love of God, amen.